I want to talk to you this morning about a subject that affects everybody. No matter who we are, we have to deal with this. And these are words that are associated with the subject that I want to speak on. Boiling point, giving somebody a piece of your mind. You keep doing that, you end up with no mind left. Spitting nails, what a phrase, blowing up, going ballistic going po postal, going through the roof, getting hot under the collar, flying off the handle, and erupting. All of those phrases, those words, are references to what we all know as anger. Anger is a powerful emotion. God gave us anger, along with all the other emotions that we have, to learn how to use it. But if we abuse it, it abuses us. When a person becomes angry, especially if they're angry uh, over and over again, what happens is their, their blood pressure rises, their pulse speeds up, and their muscles tighten. The one thing that anger does is it, it can do damage internally as well as externally. I read uh, years ago of a man in LA who was arguing over a parking spot he had a stroke and died. That ended the argument. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing that anger can do in his extreme. James tells us this. He says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We got to be quick to hear. Slow to speak, because if we're slow to speak, it gives us a chance to think, and then slow to become angry. Sometimes we need to become angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not, but there's, there are times and there are places for anger, and anger needs to be doing something real other than just exploding. Many times when somebody is angry, what we do is we see the anger. It's easy to see the anger because you can heal it. You can feel the heat. It's there. It's like the iceberg. What you see is anger, but what you don't see is what is fueling the anger. And so many times it's a person feels humiliated or the insecurity or there is fear or rejection. These are the things that actually create the outburst of anger, hurt, frustration. The, the, the anger is not so much the problem as the issue is what is down underneath the tip of the iceberg. Nine-tenths of the iceberg is underwater. You can't see it. Uh, many times it's those issues that are underneath that actually are creating the outburst of anger. And when you, need, when you deal with anger, you need to deal with the reason why the anger is there. And it's usually underneath the iceberg. Now, in 1 Samuel 25, we have a story that is an exceptional story when it comes to insight into the subject of anger. And it, and it goes this way. 1 Samuel 25 Two and three, now, there was a man in Moan whose business was in Carmel. Moan is about a, a mile from Carmel, so he had his business really close, one mile away. And the man was very rich, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. And then we read the name of the man was Nabal. The word Nabal, by the way, means fool. Anybody that would give their son the name fool either knows something or doesn't know. And the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding, in some versions as clever and beautiful appearance. So she was smart and beautiful, a great combination. And, and when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, why did she marry him? He was nasty. He was angry. And he was evil in his doings. Well, I, I think what they did is they arranged marriages in those days. And so she was married to him, and she discovered. And, and then she wore a wedding ring on the wrong finger to remind her that she married the wrong guy. So now there, there are really three main characters in this story. We have Nabal, we have Abigail. Uh, Nabal and Abigail is like Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> this guy is a beast. And then we have David. 
David is in the wilderness with 600 of his armed men, and he is providing a service for the rich ranch holders and the sheep holders in the area. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, and that's a clue that in those days it was customary whenever the harvest period came, David and his men would collect a thanksgiving offering because they provided protection and security for the shepherds and to protect them from bandits and the raiders that would come and steal their sheep. So at the end of harvest, the beginning of harvest time, he would send some of his men to the rich people to get a little love offering. So he sends 10 of his young men to Nabal and in a very polite way and a tactful way, they greet him and they thank him and they say, please give us whatever you can, whatever you find suitable. Nabal's response is the problem. This is how he responded. Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? Obviously, he knew who David was, if he knows who his dad is. There are many servants nowadays who break away, each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread, my water, and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? He knew exactly who David was. He knew where he was from, knew his father's name. He knew he was connected to King Saul. He also knew he was on the run. He should have known he had 600 armed men with him. Whether he knew that or not is immaterial. The point is, he insulted David in a very sarcastic way. The problem with that is he did it publicly. You insult somebody publicly, you are adding a new dimension to the problem. So David's 10 young men were there, and also the servants of Nabal were there, and they're listening to this exchange going on, and, and you, you are watching Nabal in an angry mood, just quickly bursting out his venom against David. Years ago, I was in Hawaii with Nancy Ann, and while we were there, they had some kind of an advertisement that you can get a free gift that you're willing to sit down and listen to a, a watch a DVD, uh, uh, an explanation for timeshare. Uh, anybody ever had done that? So you get a free gift if you go. You don't have to buy, but you go. So Nancy and I went. I think they gave us a Jeep. I'm not sure what it was for the day. So we go in and sit down and listen to this thing about timeshare, and it sounded nice. They, and after the, the viewing of it, some guy comes out, sits down at the table with us, and explains the financial arrangement. Basically, bottom line was, we would give him $300,000 for the privilege of, and we didn't come there to give $300,000. <laughs> we came there for the free prize, that's why we were there. So we said no, and, and he got angry. And, and I'm thinking, you're getting angry? You got me into this place because of this free prize thing, and now that I don't want to put $300,000 on the stage, you getting angry? There ain't no way you're gonna make an impact because anger is a bad way to lead into a smooth talk. There's some things anger does not belong in. That was one of them. So we left and we got the free thing, whatever it was, and we had a good time. And I don't know what he was doing. He was probably taking Malox to dealing with his anger. In fact, you know, he, re he reminded me of a mafia man. He, he you know, he looked like that. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, you're talking to an Italian. <laughs> it 
David listens to what Nabal says, and David has a response to it. And David said to his men, every man get her, gird on your sword. David's not even thinking. He's insulted. Nabal is sarcastic. He simply tells his men, put your sword on. And he has 400, he has 600 men. He has 400 men get armed. 200 men watch the stuff. And 400 men, and they're going to go and they're going to kill Nabal. But listen to what it goes on to say. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. This man is angry. Angry to the point where he's, listen to this. David has been protecting the servants of Nabal in the wilderness when they're taking care of their sheep. Now he's so angry he wants to kill the very men he was protecting. Anger is one letter short of danger. Just put a D in front of it and you get danger. Anger is also borderline insanity. What, what David was going to do was insane. And you know, when you read the story, you realize something. Nabal is is nasty, he is evil, he is angry and harsh. And he's rich. But you would think if a person was rich, he wouldn't have a reason to become angry. After all, he's got riches. But that's no protection for anger. You can be rich or poor and be very angry. But when you look at David's life, you've got to realize something else. You could be anointed of God. You could be called by God. You could be one of God's chosen kids, a man after God's own heart. And go off half-cocked. Fly off the handle. There's no protection just because you happen to be close to the Lord that you're going to be protected. Uh, and anger is an equal opportunity disaster. It knock on anybody's door. And when a person becomes angry, they, they actually borderline become insane. They do things that are crazy. I, I read about an Indian tribe back in the days when, when the colonials were taking over more and more land. The Indian tribe, this particular Indian tribe, got so angry at the colonial guys that they got into uh, their canoes and decided they were going to row to Europe and make their complaint known. They never came back. Because when you get angry, you may do something you will always regret. There's an insanity attached with anger. It's like, it's like dropping a nuclear bomb to kill a mosquito. You get the mosquito, and you get all their relatives and all the people around him, and, and the city around him, and the communities around him. But that's, that's it. That's anger. And the reason why Nabal is known as a harsh and an angry person is because he was angry and got away with it. His wealth, his riches, kept him from having to deal with the problem that his anger created, and so he played with fire. He kept on playing with fire. But you keep on playing with fire, eventually you're going to get burned. That's what's going to happen to Nabal. Nabal doesn't realize this, but those 10 young men went back to David, and David said, put on your sword. We're going to kill this guy and his, and his household. Well, one of the servants of Nabal heard what was going on, and he went, and it says that one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, she was the sensible one, saying, look, David sent messages from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us. And we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we were in the fields. And Abigail, you got to do something because there's tragedy coming. And he says, consider what you will do. And you know, it's a, it's a clue there. Consider what you will do because it's possible that they went to Abigail to deal with other problems that were created by Nabal. Consider what you will do and, and because she probably helped undo some problems before. Consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel 
and no one can speak to him. I focused in on that word. He's such a scoundrel, which means he never got their respect. He got their fear, but never their respect. And so they considered him a scoundrel, and you can't even, you, and so you can't even talk that way. And in fact, if you're dealing with somebody who's angry, what do you say? What, do you, what, what can you say to somebody? Because if you say anything to somebody who's angry, they'll be defensive and they're going to shoot right back, and then now you've got anger all over again. You don't want to go through that again. So what you do when you're dealing with somebody who's angry, who hurts you, is you walk away. It's just natural to withdraw. And, and, and by withdrawing, you are actually isolating the person who is angry. Now that the person who is angry, by the way, the person is angry usually gets over it real quick, and he can't understand why you, what do you, I, that was then, this is now. And the person who's hurt says, oh no, <laughs> to themselves. Uh, then is now. Because when you put a hurt into somebody, you could forget about it if you were the angry person, but the person who's hurt is not gonna forget about it. It just, it just, and, and sometimes the angry person will say, well, well I'm sorry. A and shouldn't sorry take care of it? Yeah, sorry can take care of it, but it does, sorry doesn't remove the hurt. And the angry person can say, well, don't Christians forgive? Of course they forgive. If you ask for forgiveness, Christian has to forgive, but does you think that means they forget? It's just like you, you say you're forgiven and then they erase what it said, what, what? I don't understand what, what? It, don't forget, it's still there, it's still. And, and the problem with is the anger is the person who gets angry, gets angry, he forgets, the other person doesn't forget because they're hurt, and so they withdraw, and the person who is angry at first gets angry again, because they withdrew, and it reminds me of a grizzly bear. This is what we need to know about it. A grizzly bear is a, a creature that will give you a bear hug if it likes you. It might kill you, but if he likes you, he's gonna give you a bear hug. And the problem with the grizzly bear is the grizzly bear will also give a hug to something he doesn't like. So you really never know what kind of hug means. We said the hug may come if they don't like you, and the hug comes if they do like you. So you can imagine this, the grizzly bear lumbers into a campsite, and there's a kettle burning with food in, in the middle of it, and the grizzly bear smells the food, and he comes to the kettle, and he likes what it is that he smells, and he gives the hot kettle a bear hug. Ooh, that hurts. But when a grizzly bear is hurt, he gives it another hug, and then he pulls away. He's angry, so he gives it... It's a vicious cycle. And that's what happens with the problem of anger. Anger creates a vicious cycle. Angry, angry again, angry again, angry again. It keeps on, it's something that they, so what do you do? What do you do? I wanna give you some good biblical information about handling subjects like, and just not anger, any emotional experience that a person has, they seem to be tied to and they can't shake it loose. This is what can be done. You remember the story of Peter who betrayed Jesus three times? And then later after Jesus was resurrected, Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I love you. So three times he denied Jesus, and three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? And the third time, Simon Peter of Jonah, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Talk is cheap. Anybody can say, yes, I love you. But the proof is in what we do. And Jesus is telling Peter, I accept the fact that you love me, but you need to show the love that you have. Feed the sheep. That's our way of showing. It's, do, it's in doing, it's not in saying. Saying is a wonderful thing, but, but it's in doing that helps erase the problem that is created. And Peter is told, you feed my sheep. You see, what we 
owe God is payable to his kids. You say you love me? Feed the sheep. Feed those who are around you. Which means you bless those who are around you, and that's your way of proving to me that you love me. Now, I, I, want, I want you to take this story just one step beyond. So Abigail does exactly that. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, 25 gallons of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs. She's on a, on a rush to get to David before he gets to Nabal. And she makes a speedy journey to David in order to feed his sheep and to let him know that she wants to avoid a disaster that's about to take place. And this is what we read about, <clears throat> about Abigail. Abigail takes blame, takes the blame. She didn't do anything. But she took the blame. She asked David to forgive her. But she didn't do anything to be forgiven. But she identifies with her husband because of the sake of the household. And what she's doing is she's smart. The Bible says at the very beginning she's clever. She is disarming a hitman. She knows how to get to his heart. So she puts it on herself. I'm to blame. Forgive me. And then she predicts that David will indeed sit on the throne, even though King Saul is after him. God will bring him the blessing that he said he was going to bring. And David's anger is diffused. And he says this, Blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself. You helped me come to my senses because what anger does, it makes you lose your senses. But because of her kind words, his anger was diffused, and he ends up blessing God. I'm telling you, you take somebody who is angry and get them to start blessing God, you've done an amazing turnaround. And that's what Abigail does. She, she sees David now is remorseful, and he, she has averted a major crisis. And the Bible says she went back home. Now, now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry, for he was very drunk. He was absolutely clueless. And that's another thing that what anger will do. Anger will get us to the point where all we're thinking is disturbed, but we are actually clueless of what it is we're doing. We don't even know what he's doing. And not only that, he's drunk. He's intoxicated. Intoxicated means you don't know what you're doing. Did you ever meet some intoxicated person, somebody really intoxicated? They don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're... I was at, uh, years ago, I was at um, some restaurant. They closed it down after I left. No, I, <laughs> I forgot the name of it. Claim Jumper. Claim Jumper. And I'm walking in with the family and we're sitting down. And some guy comes up to me, put his arms around me. I didn't even know him. He was totally drunk. Because when you're drunk, you do crazy things. No wonder Nabal is drinking. He is trying to get rid of this crazy thing that he's going through in his life. He's vicious and harsh and angry and, and maybe being drunk kind of keeps him away from dealing with the real issue that he's going through. He says, when you imbibe too much scotch, you'll see double on your digital watch. Here's the truth. Jesus breaks every fetter. You know the reason why an uh, angry person has to get over his anger is because it's a fetter. Do you know the reason why people who are afraid need to get dealing with the fear that they have is because Jesus breaks every fetter. And we need to be able to bring the fetter. We need to be able to bring the problem. We need to be able to bring the insecurity. We need to be able, maybe, we need to, be able to bring the, the jealousy. We need to be able to bring the negativity. We got to bring, you know what? It's easy for an angry person to forget the fact he was angry, but that's the problem. The problem is you cannot forget the weakness. You got to take the weakness to Jesus. If you don't take the weakness to Jesus, 
It's as if you're denying you got the problem. So you got to be conscious of the fact this is a dysfunction. Dysfunction is something that doesn't work right. I got I got arthritis in two fingers. They don't work the way they should work. That means it's 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 a disease. It's a problem. It's a dysfunction. When we have a dysfunction that is emotional or spiritual, it's a dysfunction that needs to be brought to Jesus. Jesus handles those dysfunctional things. Whatever that dysfunction is, Jesus breaks every fetter. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and heal your disease I am the Lord your healer Years ago I was talking with somebody and we were discussing addictions and past addictions and Jesus comes and heals and gives us the victory that we need So I said something like this you know you you, you were an alcoholic but you're not an alcoholic now, but you still were. And he said, he said, that, well, that was then, but this is now. I don't, ha- I don't have to deal with it. And I thought there was something wrong with that statement because it doesn't mean you have to rub your face in, in the wrong that was done. It means you should never forget it. We should never forget what it is Jesus did when he rescued us. Listen to this. This is what Hebrews says, for we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. If you forget the feeling, you can't be touched. What's the touch? Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. I got to remember that that was my infirmity, and it is still my infirmity. And without Jesus' help, I would fall down flat on my face. It's like like Jesus is the crutch that we need. And if somebody kicks the crutch out from underneath us, we're going to fall. It's got to be something that I remember, something that if if Jesus healed, you know, when, when we get saved, and and as the song goes, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. We can't forget his mercy. We can't forget the pit that he pulled us out of. We can't forget the weakness that we're struggling with. It's what Jesus uses to heal us. He is touched by the feelings. If I don't have the feelings, there's nothing for him to touch. So bring that feeling, bring that feeling to Jesus today, whatever that may be. It, it could be anger, it could be, it could be fear, it could be insecurity, it could be some, some other emotional the storm that goes on that makes us dysfunctional. Bring it to Jesus. Heal me. Jesus, heal me. Me.